Welcome to Wellspring, a life plan community in Greensboro, North Carolina. We're coming to you from our Virginia Somerville Sutton Theater, the crown jewel within an even larger, recently added amenity, our resident activity center. In operation less than two years, this 350 seat theater has already hosted plays, concerts, lectures, and more through partnerships with some of this region's most prominent arts organizations. In fact, Dr. Elliot Engel was one of our very first guests shortly after the theater opened in 2019. Our theater is just one of the many reasons retired individuals and couples select Wellspring for this important period in their lives. Here, they can be physically active, socially engaged, and most importantly, know that they are secure in the assurance of a continuum of care provided by the best professionals in the business. We look forward to hosting you here in our theater, in person, so you can see for yourself how truly special Wellspring is. For now, we're very proud to partner with Our State Magazine on this virtual series and hope you enjoy Dr. Elliot Engel. Welcome to In Plain English, starring Dr. Elliot Engel. Thank you, Wellspring, for your sponsorship. My name is Amy Wood Pasquini, Travel and Events Director at Our State. Dr. Elliot Engel is originally from Indianapolis, Indiana. He currently lives in Raleigh, North Carolina, where he has taught at the University of North Carolina, North Carolina State University, and Duke University. He received his MA and PhD as a Woodrow Wilson Fellow at UCLA. While there, he won the Outstanding Teacher Award. Dr. Elliott's 10 books have been published in England, America, Japan, and Turkey. His articles have been published in numerous magazines, including Newsweek. Currently, Dr. Engel lectures on more than 100 different literary and historical topics throughout Europe. Asia, New Zealand, and Australia. He has also lectured in 48 states, including, as he says, the state of exhaustion. In his spare time, Dr. But wait, he has no spare time. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Elliot Engel. Thank you, Amy, and Happy New Year, and Happy New Year to all of you. We come to the final installment of this lecture series here on January 14th of a brand new year. I am delighted to be giving the talk tonight on Our Slippery Mother Tongue, A Light History of the English Language. Now this was advertised as a light history of the English language, and it is, but you really can't give a talk about the history of the English language without first saying something about the history of language in general. In other words, why are you sitting there tonight listening to me move my vocal cords in order to communicate with you what I want you to learn in the next few minutes? I know you already know this, but for thousands and thousands of years on earth, primitive people never thought about the voice for communication. Originally, when people wanted to communicate, it didn't involve the voice. They had two methods. If they wanted to communicate something to you, they either used sign language or they used gestures. And that was it. But linguists tell us that language began 250,000 years ago. And by an incredible coincidence, I think it was January 14th, 250, well, anyway, how in the world could they say if it was 310,000 years ago or 180,000 years ago? So they have selected a quarter million years ago as the time that we finally decided that the voice was more flexible than gestures or sign language 
to actually communicate. Now, how did we start? We have no idea because it was so far back. But linguists do think that they do know the two first sounds that were made by primitive people in order to attract attention, in order to communicate, and they were these. They said primitive people originally either blew air out of their mouth like this, which gives us today the sound that we now call W, or they put their vocal cords together and they hummed, which gives us today the sound that we call M. These two sounds, the W and the M, almost all linguists agree are probably the first two sounds for communication. So, did language begin at this point? Well, no, because you really can't have a conversation, or a good one, using just a W and an M. The question is, how did we go from those two to what is coming out of my mouth right now, such a diverse language? That we do know. That we can answer. Okay. We had those first two sounds, a W and an M. And then people realized they needed a lot more for a language. They needed about 20. That is the average. Some languages like ours have 26 sounds. The language with the fewest sounds you probably know is Hawaiian. That's only 12. But basically we have about 20 different sounds. How did we get them? Well, primitive people figured out they could imitate the sounds they heard in nature in their voice to get the rest of the letters. For example, um, when they heard the wind blow, they already had that one, W. But primitive people noticed in late fall, when the leaves were coming off the trees, if the wind would blow through leaves that were dying coming off the trees, it didn't make the sound of W anymore. When the wind would blow through dead leaves, it made this sound, the sound we call S. So now we've got three sounds, but where'd we get the others? Well, that is really easy. Somebody way back when, who was really clever and really lazy, figured out, why should I have to put my mouth in 20 different positions to get 20 different sounds if I could cheat, if I could find a shortcut. He or she did find a shortcut, and we are still using it today. This is how we get our sounds. This person figured out that if you wanted to make an S, you did this. S but if you hummed when you made an S, you did this. Z a Z is the exact same thing you do with your mouth as an S, except you hum it. They figured out how to make a P. Someone hummed and they got B. A B is the exact same thing you do with your mouth as a B, except you hum it. They figured out how to make an F. Someone hummed and rather than F, they ended up with V. A V is the exact same thing you do with your mouth as an F, except you hum it. They figured out how to make a T. T. Someone hummed and rather than T, they ended up with D. A D is the exact same thing you do with your mouth as a T, except you hum it. They figured out how to make a K. K. Someone hummed, and rather than K, they ended up with G. A G is the exact same thing you do with your mouth as a K, except you hum it. This could get boring, so I won't go on. You're thinking could get boring, but I am trying to show you that primitive people were so lazy and so clever, they put their mouth in only about 10 different positions. They hummed half of them, they didn't hum the other, and it gives us almost every consonant that we are still speaking today. But it does leave out the six most distinct sounds in our language, which we have all been taught from kindergarten on are the vowels, and you know them. A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. But they lied to you in kindergarten. We do not have six distinct vowel sounds. How come? Because primitive people were lazy, God bless them. They figured out a way to put their mouth in only three different distinct positions, and they give us all six vowels. 
the only three distinct vowels we have are O, U, and four E's. The one we pronounce E, we named it E. So even slow people got that one. But then primitive people thought, well, what if I said ah and then e? So they did. It gave them ah, e. Didn't do a thing for them. So then they thought, what if I said ah and e at the same moment? If you say ah and e simultaneously, as you know, you say i. Half ah, half e, i. Then they said, well, what if I said eh? Eh. Say eh and then say e, but put them together. You say eh and e at the same moment, you say a. So there we are. We've got six distinct vowels only moving our mouths three different ways. O, U, and four E's. A, E, I, Y. That's the other one. And we've got all our vowels. Now, the next thing I'm going to tell you, I suspect you'll remember, perhaps at the strangest times, but it is the big, big puzzle that for years linguists could not figure out, and it is this. If you would check every alphabet ever invented for every different civilization, and there are thousands, because most civilizations, when they go to place the sounds that make up their language, they put them in random order. For example, I mean, in our language, B comes near the beginning, O is in the middle, but look at Greek, alpha to omega. O is not their middle letter, it's their last letter. This should not surprise you. They're all random because every society creates their own alphabet and they don't use the order of anybody else's. There's nothing surprising about that, but there is something surprising about this. It turns out that although the order of the letters and sounds are random, in 90% of the alphabets on Earth, there is one sound that is always in the same place. It is in first place. It is the sound of ah. We call it a, the Greeks call it alpha, the Hebrews call it aleph, but it doesn't matter what you call it, in nine out of 10 alphabet, it always comes first. And so linguists for years tried to figure out if all the other sounds are in random order, what is it about the sound of A that always gives it the premier spot? And it was a linguist at the University of California, Berkeley in 1964 who figured it out. And all he needed, he didn't have to do historical research, he used logic, he thought, there's got to be something about the sound of ah that is so important to us as human beings that we have always given it the first spot in the alphabet. And then he figured out what it had to be because there are only two physical things that have always connected all human beings. They are called our two physical instincts. If you don't know what your two physical instincts are by now, you really need to learn them. All human beings have only had two. As you probably know, all of us have an instinct for hunger and all of us have an instinct for sex. And this linguist pointed out that when you satisfy either of those two human instincts, the sound that automatically comes out of your mouth is the sound of ah. You can't help it. It is our most instinctive sound, the sound of ah, and it is the reason we have given it the top place in all the alphabets. Now, if some of you are thinking, ah, well, that can't be true. Well, I want you to try an experiment. Not now, of course, but sometime, after you've had a really good meal, let's say, listen to yourself. You satisfy an instinct, you will say, ah. That was the big mystery solved by a brilliant young man at the University of California, Berkeley. Now, unfortunately, everything I have told you so far in this talk has nothing to do with my topic. 
which is the history of the English language. Why are the sounds I am making for you tonight English? Who do we begin the history of English with? We begin it with a man you all know, and he never spoke a word of English. His name, Julius Caesar. That's who we start the history of English with. As you know, Julius Caesar was a Roman. What do the Romans have to do with language? Listen carefully. When the Romans conquered all of Italy, they made everybody there speak Latin. Today it's called Italian. When the Romans conquered France, they made everybody there speak Latin, but today it's called French. When the Romans conquered Spain, all those poor people had to stop speaking their native tongue. They had to start speaking Latin, but as you know, today it's called Spanish. When the Romans conquered Portugal, all those people had to start speaking Latin, but today it's called Portuguese. And there's only one more. When the Romans conquered Romania, not only did they make those poor spe people speak Latin, which today is called Romanian, but they also named the country after the people who conquered it, Romania. Well, in 55 BC, Julius Caesar conquered what is today England. You would have thought he made everybody there speak Latin, which today we call, well, we don't know what we would have called it, but the one thing we never would have called it is English. The first thing you need to know about your language, and it's a shocker, it is 0% Latin at its roots. Now, I was a Latin minor in college. I have taught Latin. I like the language, but at its roots, it is not at all a Latin-based language. Why not? Every other place the Romans conquered, they made them speak Latin. They're speaking a Romance or Latin-based language today. Caesar conquers England in 55 BC. We are not speaking a Latin-based language. Why? Historians tell us that Caesar took one look at that godforsaken little island with its lousy weather out in the middle of nowhere, so far away from all the power which was down south and east at Rome, that he basically said, why would we give these people this sophisticated language? He didn't want to bother. England was such worthless real estate in 55 BC that Caesar made the exception and did not make us speak that Latin-based language then. Well, Rome fell in 500, and everybody who was uh, Roman left. And so in the year 500 AD, England was wide open for somebody to conquer it and give you almost every word you spoke at dinner this evening. Who conquers England in 500 AD and gives us our language? Three tribes. You certainly know two of them. One tribe was called the Angles. One tribe was called the Saxons. The third tribe was called the Jutes. The Jutes kind of disappear into history, but the Angles and Saxons give you your language. Now you noticed I've told you that they give you your language four or five different times. Well, I'm gonna have to prove it and I will be glad to do so. What words do you speak today that are Anglo-Saxon German? Almost every one syllable word out of your mouth is Anglo-Saxon German. All the four letter words are Anglo-Saxon German. Words like me, go, through, by, for, hear, see, them, smell, sniff, all of those words are Anglo-Saxon German. Listen to what I just said. All of those words are Anglo-Saxon German. They're all Anglo-Saxon German, too. Listen to what I just said. They're all Anglo-Saxon German, too. All of them. What did I just say? All of them. All Anglo-Saxon German. In fact, every word that has fallen out of my mouth in the last three and a half minutes has been nothing but Anglo-Saxon German words but one. The only word that you have heard me speak in the last four minutes that was not an Anglo-Saxon German word was the word Anglo-Saxon. It's a Latin form. Other than Anglo-Saxon, they are all Anglo-Saxon German words. So the second thing you need to know about your language, one, it is 100% Anglo-Saxon German words. Two, 
It is not Latinate in its roots at all. Those are terribly important things. Almost every word out of your mouth will be Anglo-Saxon German. Well, if that's true, if almost every word out of your mouth is Anglo-Saxon German, why in the world did we call our language English and not Anglo-Saxon? Well, here's the big news. We didn't call it Anglo-Saxon. From the time they conquered in 500, for the next 565 years, nobody in England spoke anything but Anglo-Saxon German. And then in one really big year that we all had to memorize in history class, in the year 1066, everything changed and English was accidentally invented. What happened in 1066? I'm sure you know. In 1066, a man named William conquered England. But what does this mean? Who is this William man? Where is he from? He is from what we call today France. What was he speaking? Well, he was speaking Latin with a French accent. He is speaking French. So you've got this French-speaking king, William the Conqueror, who conquers England in October of 1066. Not only does he conquer England, he kills the English king. He kills the nobleman. He takes over. And at the end of October 1066, England is owned by what is today France. Now you realize when William the Conqueror conquered this little island of England, he had every right to tell the population of England I'm sorry, folks, I won this war, you lost it. I'm your conqueror. I am speaking beautiful French Latin. You are speaking hideous Anglo-Saxon German. Starting tomorrow, you learn the language of your conqueror French or you will die. He had every right to do it. Had he done it, it is a fact you would be listening to me tonight in French. I'd be a French speaker, you'd be a French speaker. We'd all be speaking French because William would have insisted that we transfer over and we would have never transferred back. And yet he didn't know, do it. How come? Historians tell us that William took one look at that God-forsaken island of England with its smelly peasants and lousy weather and he said the exact same thing that Julius Caesar had said a thousand years before. He said, why would we give God's greatest gift to earth, which the French have always thought is their peculiar language, to these heathens? They are not worthy. For the second time we were spared speaking a Latin-based language, this time French, because the conqueror thought it was a worthless piece of real estate and was not going to make us convert. And yet, from the day William conquered in 1066, we never spoke Anglo-Saxon purely again, and English was accidentally invented. Now, who is responsible for the invention of English. You're going to find this hard to believe. If we had to pick one group of people who are more responsible for the language of English getting started, it would be of all people the French soldiers who came over from France to conquer the English. This is what happened. These French soldiers came over to England to conquer them. They fought all those Englishmen. But while they were over fighting the Englishmen in England, the French soldiers took a look at all those Anglo-Saxon peasant women and they thought they were hot. And so they decided that they would like these women. So they killed all the husbands in the war. They went back to France and they decided, you know, I think I'd like to marry that Anglo-Saxon peasant. But they're a French soldier. They needed permission from William's court. So the soldiers go to William's court and say, I know I'm a Frenchman, but I've fallen in love with an Anglo-Saxon peasant woman. I would like to marry her. May I? And the court said, sure, go ahead. And then the French soldier said, I've checked out real estate prices way cheaper in that crummy England than they are here in France. So not only would I like to marry 
the Anglo-Saxon peasant woman, I want to move there and live in England, may I? And of course the court said, go ahead. And then the Frenchman said, well, there's only one problem. You know, all I speak is our beautiful French Latin, but all she speaks is that hideous Anglo-Saxon German. I don't understand a word of that guttural language. I do need permission to teach my wife the French Latin language. And the court said, never. You will never teach that common, guttural, ugly, Anglo-Saxon peasant woman our beautiful French language. And so the soldier said, well, that's a shame. That means I'm gonna have to learn her hideous Anglo-Saxon German. Never, said the court, you will never pollute your beautiful French speaking mouth with that God awful Anglo-Saxon language. So even the dumbest soldier said, but wait a minute, if all I'm speaking is French Latin and she doesn't understand that, and all she's speaking is Anglo-Saxon German, I don't have a clue what that is, we can't communicate. And although this is very oversimplified, as you could well imagine, it is the answer that clever William gave to his French soldiers that is responsible for us speaking what we call English today. What William logically said was, look, you keep speaking your French Latin. She keeps speaking her Anglo-Saxon German. Very soon, the most useful words of both languages make themselves apparent, and you will have a brand new, hybrid, streamlined way of communication, and that is exactly what English still is today. Basically, we are the same Anglo-Saxon German vocabulary that we have had for 1,500 years. But in 1066, when William, the French speaker, conquered England, he did not do what most people would have. He did not drive out the Anglo-Saxon German and replace it with French Latin. Instead, he did the unthinkable. He dumped every one of his French Latin words on top of the Anglo-Saxon German words that were already there. And the marriage of Anglo-Saxon vocabulary with French Latin vocabulary is what we call English. It is a hybrid of French Latin and Anglo-Saxon German. And from now on, when you go to speak a word in the English language, you should have a pretty good idea if what's coming out of your mouth is an Anglo-Saxon origin or a French Latin origin, because it turns out when you are using your simplest, most obvious short vocabulary. When you are talking to people you don't need to impress intellectually, I mean your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, your cat, your dog, or the clerk of, at the mall, what comes out of your mouth is nothing but good old easy Anglo-Saxon German words. But when you have to appear intelligent, even though you're not, let's say you're writing a business letter, you need a $50 word for a 50 cent thought, you go to that thesaurus, you find something with five syllables, you're not sure what it means, but you throw it in and hope for the best, it is always French Latin because it is abstract, philosophical, intellectual, all our abstract intellectual words are French Latin, all our simple, easy words are Anglo-Saxon German, and I will prove it. The word ask, A-S-K, short, ugly, simple, you guessed it, Anglo-Saxon German. But the word interrogate, that means the exact same thing that ask does, policemen invented it to make themselves feel important, the word interrogate that makes a science out of the simple deed of asking, it is, of course, French Latin. Sweat. You can imagine that sweat is Anglo-Saxon German. But perspiration that doesn't smell at all, perspiration is, of course, French Latin. That animal we see in the woods, the deer, D-E-E-R, deer, is Anglo-Saxon German. But when they kill it, take it to a restaurant, cook it, put it on a plate, put a piece of parsley next to it, charge 32 bucks for it, they knew if they put on their menu, special tonight, dead deer, nobody was buying. 
So in desperation to get the big money, they changed it to the French, venison. And people saw the menu and thought, venison, that must be worth 33 bucks plus tip. And sure enough, we've called it venison at the restaurant ever since. The word angry is Anglo-Saxon. The word mad is Anglo-Saxon. But the word discombobulated, that means the same thing as being angry and upset, discombobulated is, of course, French Latin. As one person once said, the single most French Latin word in the English language is, of course, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. The easy words are Anglo-Saxon German, the sophisticated words are French Latin, but when William conquered England, he did not give us what I'm speaking today. I am speaking modern English. When William conquered, he gave us what is called Middle English. The greatest Middle English writer by far is Geoffrey Chaucer. His greatest work by far is the Canterbury Tales. So you can guess what's coming next in this talk, whether you want to hear it or not. I am about to quote for you the famous opening lines of the Canterbury Tales in the original Middle English as Chaucer wrote it, so you can hear what Middle English sounded like. Now, I know what some of you were thinking. Big deal, I had a vicious English teacher in high school. We had to memorize those open lines. I can quote Middle English just like you. But you can't. Don't even try. Your Middle English accent is pathetic and embarrassing. And that's the truth. You were not taught it accurately. I have done research. It seems to me there is only one living scholar in the world today who can pronounce Middle English just like Chaucer did. Your luck, he's here tonight at the final lecture to let you know what Chaucer sounded like. Now, I'm convinced I have a perfect Middle English accent. The reason is because I went to UCLA for graduate school. Now, UCLA isn't the best school in the world. It's not Harvard, it's not Yale, it's not Guilford Tech. But what we do have at UCLA that even Guilford Tech didn't have, we happen to have a professor who was world renowned in Chaucerian English. Her name was Professor Black. She had an international reputation and all of us graduate students had to take Middle English from her. Now, it was really odd that Professor Black had an international reputation. She was a terrible teacher. She was quite lazy. She never published a book. She never published an article. And yet this woman was renowned throughout the world because she claimed when she read Geoffrey Chaucer aloud, her accent was more accurate and pure to Geoffrey Chaucer's English than anybody else. And actually, those of us who were her graduate students, we absolutely believed her because we believed that she had actually heard Geoffrey Chaucer at one of his final readings. This woman was old and mean, but she did know how to teach Middle English. And so what you're about to hear, according to Professor Black, is exactly how Chaucer would have pronounced it. As you probably know, his opening lines of the Canterbury Tales go like this. One that April with her showers sota, the draught of March hath pierced to the rota, and bothered every vein in swish liqueur, of which vertu in gendred is the fleur. One zephyrus ache with his sweet a braith, in spirit hath in every holt and haith, the tender croppers on the younger sunna, hath in the ram his halva course e runner, and smaller fool mocking melodia that sleep in all the nicht with open ear. So pricketh them not to her in her courages, then long in folk to go on pilgrimages. Now that's how Professor Black would do it, but I want to go back to those first two lines and teach you something. Listen to it again. One that April with her shouters sota, the draught of March hath pierced to the rota. 
Do you realize that an 11-year-old child could translate every one of those words but one? They have not changed meaning at all. One that April with her shower sota, when that April with his shower something, the draught of March hath pierced to the rota, the drought of March has pierced to the root. An 11-year-old can translate them all but one, the only one he couldn't get or she couldn't get, one that April with her shower sota, when that April with his shower sota, in Middle English, sota meant sweet. When that April with his shower sweet. It still means sweet in modern English, but we've hummed it. We don't say sota, we say soda. Look up soda in the dictionary from chemistry. It's a sweetening agent. A soda pop, drink a soda, it still means sweet. The words have not changed. But the reason it's Middle English is the pronunciation. One that April. In Chaucer's day, the fourth month of the year was pronounced April. As you know, we don't say April anymore. How come? Because we speak modern English. We speak a better language. We don't say April. We say April. Now there's a hideous word for you. April. If it's your granddaughter's name, I'm sorry. Ugly. April sounds like something in a zoo. Strangely, April is a beautiful name. Had I had a daughter, I would have loved to name her April. It's a beautiful name, but don't let it fool you. It is beautiful because it refers to the fourth month of the year when all the flowers open. In fact, April is from the Latin, aperi. It means to open. The aperture of a camera is the opening. April, it's beautiful, but we pronounce it April compared to April. Why would we have taken the beautiful word April and turn it into April? Listen carefully, this is the history of modern English. We took every beautiful word from Middle English, and if it was not accented on the first syllable, April, we made sure it was. Now, why did we wrench the accent away from every other syllable but the first and insist we put it on the first? Very simple. It made things so easy for us. April. You've got to say ah. You've got to say pril. It's exhausting. Change it to April. All you have to say is ape, and then you grunt. April. You move on to the next word. Chaucer's word in Middle English, mutain. That's the word for the things that are in Western North Carolina and in Colorado, mutain. Now, the original French word was montagne, but Middle English was mutain. But we don't say mutain. How come? Too much trouble. Got to say moo, got to say tain. We put it on the first syllable so we can say mow, and then we swallow. Mountain. We can go on to the next word. Here are five words in English. Each one has a different vowel in the last syllable. Drama has an A in the last syllable. Wanted has an E in the last syllable. Muffin has an I in the last syllable. Button has an O in the last syllable. Joyful has a U in the last syllable. But they're in the last syllable and we accent the first syllable. So how do we pronounce the A, the E, the I, the O, the U? Drama, the last A is uh. Wanted, the E is uh. Muffin, the I is uh. Button, the U is uh. Excuse me, the O is uh. I'll let you do joyful for yourself. It's all uh. It just turns out we accent the first syllable, we grunt the rest of the word, and we move on. Until recently, we spoke English this way. Accent first syllable, grunt the rest of the word, move on to the next word. But no, that's not how we're speaking English today. No, it turns out that a group of people have changed forever the way we speak English. It turns out that if you happen to know of anybody who is 20 years old or younger, these people, the generation of age 20 and younger, they have changed the history of the English language and they have made it far worse than anything that's ever come before. I know you suspected it, but now I will prove it. 
These young people say, oh no, you don't accent the first word in the syllable, grunt the rest of the word, move on to the next one. No, no, that's way too much trouble. Their linguistical theory, you do accent the first syllable of the first word in a sentence. Then you grunt the rest of the sentence. Then you move on to the new sentence. Let me give you an example of this. Let us say you have a 17-year-old son who drives his car to school every day at 7.30 and he comes home at 3.30. But today your son isn't home at 3.30, 4.30, 5.30, 6.30. He's not home. Did he call you to say he'd be late? Well, no, that would be considerate. Why would he do that? And then suddenly, when your son gets in his car at 6.30 and looks at his watch, he realizes that dinner at home is served at 6 o'clock unless you call and make an exception. He did not have breakfast because he got up late. He had to take a makeup exam at lunch. Your son is hungry, Anglo-Saxon. Your son is famished. French Latin. Your son will eat anything, real Anglo-Saxon. So he is racing home and he is just praying that even though he didn't call, dinner will still be waiting for him. He drives up the driveway. He runs into the house. All he cares about, there you, the mother, are standing looking angry in the kitchen. All he cares about is whether the family's already had dinner and he's out of luck. So when he looks at you, I don't care how hungry your son is, the one thing he will never say to you is, did you eat? Because only queer people today say, did you eat? Your son will look at you and give you his brand new, made up, four letter word spelled J-E-E-T. Your son will look at you and go, jeet, jeet. And of course, you the mother realize this is not Latin, this is not Martian, this is, did you eat? But why would your son go to all the energy of getting out those three syllables when he can just slop them all together, say, jeet? And of course, you know what he means. But you, the mother, are angry enough at him that you are not going to tell him whether the family's already had dinner until you ascertain, now there's a good French Latin word, until you ascertain from your son if he stopped at Taco Bell, gorged himself on a chalupa, and ruined the meal that as a good mother you have kept waiting for him in the oven even though he didn't call. So when he looks at you and says, cheat! All you want to do is find out whether he's already eaten, so you look right back at him and you say, Jew? And when you look at your son and say, Jew? He will know this is not a religious question, this is did you? But even those of us who are way over 20 years old are younger, we have caught this terrible disease of just getting things out, accenting the first syllable, moving on with incredible rapidity, and it is ruining the glory of the language that was once Byron and Keats and Shakespeare and Shelley and Chaucer. Linguists tell us that if this tradition of just getting our words out as fast as possible continues for much longer, they tell us by the year 2100, we will not be speaking English on earth. Fortunately, most of us, including me listening tonight, are way too old to have to care about that. But linguists say by the year 2100, we'll still be speaking a language that sounds basically what I'm speaking tonight, but because there will be stronger truth in advertising and labeling laws, we will have had to change the name. We will not be able to call our language English, it will be called Slurvian, because we will slur all our words together in a glop to get them out quicker so we can spend a quarter second more at the computer or the television or the telephone. That, unfortunately, is the future of English. Well, I think I've spoken long enough on the subject. I would apologize for speaking even this long, but you do remember I started 250,000 years ago in the past. I not only brought you up to this new year of 2021, but I moved ahead to 2100. I don't want to brag, but you need to know if anybody else would have given the same lecture and breathed at the same time he was talking, it would have taken twice as long. So please consider yourself lucky. 
and I consider myself lucky that those of you were kind enough to subscribe to this series and hear these five talks. Perhaps with a little luck in the future, I'll be back virtually and give you five more. Good night.